Hello and welcome. I am the Letter Hack, and with me now is a very special guest, contributor, and co host on various TYT shows, including The Breakdown, uh, a frequent guest on Friend of the Show, The Power of Report, oh, with yeah. Dan from the Internet. It's Yasmin Alia Khan. Yasmin, how are you? I am really good. Thanks for having me on this show. This is fun. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. So, this is what we call it. We say that you're in the hot seat because you're going to watch me draw you, right? But yeah. I'm yeah, in the hot seat too. I'm going to watch you watch me draw you. And, you know, this no is pressure. kind of, well, it's part of why I do this because I have to get used to this kind of stuff. Like, there you go. I'm coming out of my show. <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's a, it's, it's good to challenge yourself. Yeah. Exactly. Well, okay. So I'm learning that. <laughs> but it's good to have you here. Thank you very much. Um, I'm pretty sure that everyone watching knows who you are. But the way I always start these off is by asking for your origin story. So while I get in on this drawing, mm -hmm. would you please give us your origin story and tell us how you got into this line of work as a commentator and a podcast host? Yeah, um, very much by accident, I'll say. Oh. You know, almost reluctantly even, I got into all of this. I think... Uh, let me see how far back I want to go. Um, way back in the day, I think uh, I, I had a job and just like a like a retail job when I was in college. And I don't I think like one day it occurred to me that some of my friends, like people who I saw every single day, didn't really know a whole lot about like me or my beliefs and things like that. And they didn't really get that maybe I would have a different perspective on certain things going on in the world than they would. Be and I guess it's really sweet because they just saw me as Yasmin, you know, I was just like their friend, but, you know, I had all these different experiences and backgrounds and things like that that kind of colored my perspective on things. So whenever we would talk about, you know, whatever was going on in the world, I would always seem to offer a different uh, perspective on things. And mm. then from that, um, after a while, my friends, whenever they had a question about what was going on in the news or in the world or whatever, they would just come to me and ask me because they said that I always knew and they would ask oh. me questions like, uh, well, why do these people feel this way? And I say, well, because of this. And they say, oh, well, what do they want to happen? Well, what they want to happen is this, but it probably. And so I would always just have the answer because whether I was aware of it or not, I was always kind of keeping up with this stuff already on my own. So uh, after that, I went and I had a job in digital marketing. I have um, an MBA and I had a focus in marketing. And then from there, I got a job working as a marketer at like this little boutique fir firm. And it was um, it was very boring. It was very boring work. It was like entry, like data entry stuff for the most part. It was like really, really tedious. And, uh, you know, there, there's no originality or expression in that kind of work. So one day I realized, you know, I had a lot of things that I was always thinking about and saying. And at that job, I was actually on Twitter all the time because you're sourcing material for social media for different clients and things like that. So this was in 2015. I was seeing everything. That was when Obama was on his way out of office. Trump was on his way into office. I watched the whole thing happen. It's like if you were just on Twitter as much as I was at that time, you literally saw Trump become the president just right there. And, you know, it, it kind of... It was a little scary and it was hard to stomach sometimes. And, you know, I just had a lot of thoughts. So I needed a place to put them. So I went home one day after work and I just built a website and I started a blog. And then I would just post on it. I wasn't like trying to do anything with it. It was really just more of like an emotional and creative outlet for me. Um, but, you know, people started to read it. Not like a really, really humble following. But somehow J.R. Jackson found my blog and he's the one who was like, you got to do videos to go with the blog post. And I was like, I don't really want to do that. You know, <laughs> so um, it was only when he told me to do it that I started doing just like really, really terrible videos on my phone. I would write my blog post and then I would just like do a selfie style video on my phone, just kind of summarizing it. And I would put it on my Instagram and from there, um, I got to meet the people at the TYT studio. I went to, I went there and I met up with JR and I met some of the other hosts there. And then 
you know, things kind of leveled off for a while and I kind of kept doing my own thing. And eventually I launched my own podcast. I learned how to podcast. I built it from the ground up. Um, I had to learn audio editing and engineering to like, even now, like I'm not very good at it. I did all the graphics, everything for it. And it was very much a learning process putting this podcast together. So it was like a labor of love. And on that podcast, um, I would talk about global issues. I would dive into like one country or one conflict that was going on uh, and kind of go back through the whole thing and say, you know, this is how it happened. This is how it started. This is what all the different parties want, that kind of thing. And then from the podcast, um, TYT called me and they wanted me to be a contributor. And um, it's kind of funny because it was almost like exactly two years after I had gone to the studio and asked and, and met some of the people there. And then one of the girls, she was like, oh, yeah, I remember meeting you. And then uh, she thought of me to be a contributor. And here we are. So this all started out with you just having your finger on the pulse with yeah. like current affairs and politics and stuff like that. Yeah. And then you're self-taught from there. You didn't go to school for any no. of this. No, I have a degree in English Lit and an MBA that I don't use. I don't use my MBA at all. Um, I, in my mind, when I was in school, I got an English Lit degree because I always plan on going to grad school. Originally, I was going to do law school, and then I ended up going to business school. And the idea was always to just have a job that was super comfortable and reliable and pays well so I can just go do my job and then make my money, go home and live my life, right? And I thought that was like a really safe route. But I did that and I got there and I was like so bored and so unfulfilled. And I had these other interests that I don't think I was even consciously aware of for a long time. So when I say all this happened by accident and very reluctantly, it did. So I mean, you could have fooled me because you're so good at it. Like you're a natural. I, I mean, I venture to say this is what you were meant to do do you ever feel like that do you feel like I mean I know you're yeah maybe sometimes not always as comfortable as you would like to be like having to learn on the go or whatever but do you yeah. feel like this is where you should be I mean I, there's definitely a lot of imposter syndrome or maybe I mean there's less of it now but especially initially it was like I'm not educated in this field I'm sure there's so much that I don't I, it was just always plagued by there's something that I don't know that I'm missing that I should know that everybody else knows and they're not telling me. Right. So like that was kind of a thing that I had to just get over and deal with. Uh, it does feel like, I don't know if you want to call it destiny or fate or whatever, but it does feel like I ended up where I was always supposed to be because all these things that I talk about now are not new. I've always been talking about these things to a certain extent, uh, especially after 9-11. Back in 2001, I was uh, I was in eighth grade when that happened. So however, like 12, 13 years old or something. And I remember just like being very into that, you know, and just like thinking about what it meant culturally and politically going forward. And, um, and I, I was so young, I was 13. And I feel like you shouldn't have to think about things like that when you're that young, but I was. And um, I, I've always considered myself a writer. So I was always like, oh, I'm fine behind the scenes. I'll just do like copywriting or something like that. But it really like just wasn't fulfilling. And so I just started doing my own thing on the side. And then that's what took off more than my marketing. I got fired from my marketing job, actually. <laughs> so, so yeah, maybe, maybe it was meant to be. Well, you may have noticed hack is in the name of what we do here, right? Mm -hmm. Letter hack. So I'm very used to hacking my way into things. And what I think, I, it's not, I mean, I know what you mean by imposter syndrome. I, I have that. Yeah. But I think that it, um, I think a big part of that is knowing when to seize the moment, right? You see a window, you go through it, right? And mm -hmm. And that's very courageous. So that's another part of what you have been doing so don't sell yourself too short yeah. but i wonder um um when when you talk about like having to learn the graphics and the video how do you and and like you know this is probably relevant to you know your current um level of ability how do you balance production and um like performance like like um you know do you put more emphasis on 
the behind the scenes stuff or being in front of the camera or is it like e evenly balanced? I think um, <clears throat> whenever I like, like the content for me comes a lot easier. Right. And for me, I'm always worried about how things look and if it's, if it looks, I don't, I don't know if professional is the right word, but just looks like I know what I'm doing, right? Yeah. Like that's always kind of a concern for me. If it looks intentional, like I wanted it this way and this is why I'm doing it this way, not because I'm just not as good. But I mean, obviously, if you go back and look at some of the earlier stuff that I produced, you can definitely see, you know, where I've grown and evolved and that's cool. But I think I'm always like very preoccupied with the production side of things, even though I, I don't like the production side nearly as much, obviously. But um, it, it has been a balance. But I think, you know, where something like imposter syndrome comes in or where something like not having a traditional background or education in its particular field I think what that does, it just makes you work a little bit harder because you're always trying to like catch up and keep up with things and making sure that I'm ahead of the curve and not falling behind and um, being competitive to a certain degree as well. And um, I don't know, I talk too much in life anyway. So I guess I always knew that I could talk if I had to talk. I've never had a fear of public speaking or anything like that. So I just don't worry about that part as much. What's your process like um, when when making a, I call them informative videos for lack of a better term. But when making videos, um, what uh, how long do you put into like like tell us what the average length of one of your videos is and then and then kind of explain how long you work on that. Like, do you have like a limit where you're like, nope, I don't go over this many hours. That becomes not worth it. Or is it yeah. however long it takes? Uh, it, I think it's however long it takes. Um, so right now I do daily videos with TYT and I, I think I do four a week. And um, the process is, you know, it, it kind of varies every day, but I would kind of like look at a few different stories and pick one that I think that I could you know, do, do a good story with. And sometimes if I'm more limited on time, I'll pick an easier one. And other days, um, if I do have the time and I do think the story is important enough, I will take a little bit of extra time to like delve into the details. My personal process, and I can't speak to what the other um, contributors are doing because I think we all really do have our own style. Hmm. Mine is, I, I really do um research my topics as well as I can. I really try not to like mislead people by giving them too much of like my own personal. I mean, like with all my work, what I always say is that you'll know how I feel about a topic or an issue, but I'm not telling you that you also should feel that way. Oh. But I am big on like just making sure that people at least have the facts and then I'll like give a commentary at the end, you know? Um, but the facts are, and even in my scripts, whenever I, I jot them down and I send them to the production team, I always like have sources. It's like the lit major in me. I've just, I've cited everything, you know, everything is cited. It comes from somewhere. And I think they appreciate that. They like that. But, um, a lot of it is just usually I will just sit there and read the article or watch the video that I'm going to be commenting on. And then I'll read a whole bunch of other supporting articles, um, stuff that answers questions that I might have. And then once I do that and it's all in my head, then I can kind of just like spit it out and type it up and then shoot it. So, yeah, I guess that's the process. Just so everyone knows, as always, there's links to all of Yasmin's um, work in the description of this podcast. You should scroll down and make sure you check that out and support her work subscribe to her channels um and follow her social media is there maybe one story that you would like to talk about more and and like i always imagine like well what if you had that one story that took off and everyone knows you for it now you're pigeonholed would that be okay if it was a certain topic you know that that's a really interesting question i think um trying to decide what I want to say here. Um, I think my specialty has been, um, I, I used to focus more on international stories. 
uh, like when I had my podcast, it was called Global Thread, and it was always something international that was going on. And the reason why I did that is because I, um, I don't know, I just felt like a lot of these stories about what's going on in different countries, they would get some airplay on the news in, uh, you know, like CNN, MSNBC, whatever. Um, but it would be like maybe 15 minutes and then they would be talking and all these names would be spit out. And you're like, I don't even know who these people are. I don't know who these characters are. I don't know who these groups are. And, you know, for such a small segment on the, the nightly news, it was, they didn't have time to go into that kind of context. So I had the idea, well, I'll do a podcast where I kind of give people all the background information and then they can go forth as more informed viewers or, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, just people who are like keeping an eye on things. Right. Uh, so they would at least know what that is going forward. And that worked out really well. So I think what I would like to do is get back to that. And um, I probably will be getting back to that very soon. Um, so everybody keep an eye out for, for whatever is coming next for me. But um, that's what I'm saying. I, Follow Yasmin on social media. You just, I mean, you, you can't be as good at, at what you do without some sort of like, there's something around the corner. There, yeah, and, and it's like like right around the corner, but I don't think I'm supposed to like announce it yet. But um, but it's right around the corner, and I am very excited about it. Um, but I think I would like to be known for that. Um, I've I've always really liked history and geography and geopolitics, so I think that's kind of more my niche. And and you know, especially like um, with TYT um, on the damage report with John, he's always really good at kind of paying attention to who his co-host is that day and kind of, you know, working in some stories that they know that, that he knows that I would be more into. And so sometimes we'll get more Texas stories or we'll get more international stories there. So that's cool. Um, but for my content on Rebel HQ and the breakdown, I tend to focus more on, you know, national domestic issues, whatever is relevant here. Um, cause those things are just more timely, you know, for coming up with something every day and they're easier to, to talk about in a quick video. Like I can't give a whole history of a country in you know, 10 minutes or however long. So, um, <clears throat> but yeah, I, I think I would like to be known for, for that, for more global topics. Anything that you'd never want to talk about? Is there like one thing out there where you're <clears throat> like, I am done with that topic? Uh, I can't wait for Trump to not be relevant anymore. Um, I was really happy when Tucker Carlson got done. I mean, he still comes up every once in a while, but I'm glad that he, he's not there. Um, but other than that, like there are some topics that I don't talk about too much. And it's not because they're like too controversial or anything like that, or because I don't want to talk about them or whatever. It's just that there are certain topics that I think are better left for other people. I think that it, that's totally fine if I say that person is more equipped to <clears throat> or better informed to talk about a certain topic more than I am. So I'll, I'll leave it to them and I will sit here and listen to them. You know, I think that in today's landscape of commentators and commentary, everybody feels like they have to have an opinion on something. They have right. to, you know, have something to say. And I think there's a lot of value in saying, I don't know enough about this to have an opinion or to speak intelligently about it. And I don't want to say the wrong thing. And then that's even worse, you know, not just for me personally as a commentator, but for the issue, you know, I don't want to misspeak on something. So there are certain things where I'll just say somebody else can talk about this, somebody who has more personal experience there or whatever. So you are very good at articulating certain things in a way that that. I've heard other people say, but it comes across clearer oh, for thank you. whatever reason. Yeah. And I, you know, if you don't want to talk about Trump, we don't have to. But I yeah. did have I did sort of want your perspective on his base, but we can avoid that if you want. No, no, we can talk about it. We can talk about the base. Yeah, it, it, because I was it occurred to me when I was watching a video of yours recently. Um, like just, you know, we're talking about a guy who was just indicted this week for what the third time yeah, it's, uh, hard to keep count. Yeah. it's so obvious that he's like the most dishonest person right um and whenever he speaks his entire goal is to dupe everyone he's talking to including his own supporters yeah but they 
continue to think that the one guy is so obviously lying every time he opens his mouth. That's the whole reason for speaking at all is to say something completely untrue. Yeah. His entire base believes that he is the one and only guy that can fix everything and that he's going to or he has when he even had the opportunity and he didn't deliver. So yeah. I wonder, have do you have a perspective on what's going on there and why people continue to support him? I, I could think of a million answers, but yeah. I'm genuinely <laughs> interested in what you think. So I live in Texas, right? So that, I wasn't going to yeah. use and, that, but yeah, that makes sense. You know, and, and people don't realize, or I think maybe they do, but uh, the cities in Texas are blue, right? So there's there's a lot more blue in Texas than people outside. I love Houston, Texas. by the way. Thank you. Yeah, it's an interesting place. It's I don't think it gets the credit it deserves in a lot of respects, but that's another story. But um, where I live is kind of on the south side, suburban, right? I live like in a strong suburban town and there's definitely more trump supporters around here than not and um it's it's kind of difficult for me living here sometimes but it's you know it's 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 the nature of life just outside of the city that i don't think people realize and a lot of what i've seen interacting with these people and some of them i interact with regularly um for reasons but uh they don't leave Right. Like they do not leave anywhere. They don't go anywhere. They barely ever even go into the city. They barely even go into Houston or Galveston. Right. They don't leave. They don't leave the neighborhood. They don't leave the suburb. They live in gated communities. They barely leave those. Right. Like the, the worst like MAGA people that I know stay home all day and do nothing because they're retired and they do nothing. They, they garden and that's about it. You know, there really is like an unapologetic ignorance that they mm. are choosing, you know, and they watch Fox news all day or they're on Facebook all day, which is probably worse. And I think a lot of them start to um, embody and just believe these like QAnon ideas and they don't even realize it, you know, because they don't, they don't go to QAnon websites or anything right. like that. They're just, they just saw something on Facebook, you know, Echo chamber. Yeah. And it, it's really disheartening to see because it's a really um, it's like people can just like fall down a rabbit hole, not know that they're falling down it, not know that they're in the hole at all. And it, it, I've seen it destroy relationships, you know, like hmm. parents. And I think they were just talking about this in a video the other day, actually, because I, I think it's been fresh on my mind lately. But it really is like voluntary ignorance. Right. Because even if you try to tell them something, they, they don't want to hear it, you know, and mm -hmm. a lot of it, I think, also comes down to there is a common denominator that these people are like very, very religious people. And, you know, I think religion really primes you to not ask a lot of questions or to um, believe in something that you cannot see or cannot prove. So they already have this belief in faith, you know, like they, they and they think that that's a virtue, whereas some of us might say. Maybe it's not as big of a virtue as you think it is, you know? Yeah, and that closes you off to other ways of thinking. Anything yeah. else you hear is a step away from your belief and your faith. And so it's got to be wrong. That makes a lot of sense. See, I knew. I, I'm glad I asked you that question. Thank you for allowing me to. Um, I, I ask everyone that comes on this show the same thing. And I get, I'm starting to get a lot of the same answer. So it's almost predictable what, what people will say to this. Um, but do you consider yourself a journalist in any way with, well, with, well, with, no, your I, d um, I only recently realized that people refer to me sometimes as a journalist. That was news to me. And I think, no, I, I don't think, because I never went to J school, you know, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't have any formal training in this. I've never had like a, like an official job at like an official network or anything, even though TYT is, I, I think it's pretty significant um, in that realm, but it's still independent media. So I think it still doesn't get like the, the respect that it probably should for how long it's been around. But um, <clears throat> I, I think I also have friends who are like real journalists and the work that I do just seems different from the work that they do. So maybe, maybe I, 
like I wouldn't argue if somebody referred to me as a journalist, but I don't think I would refer to myself as that. No. Here's, here's the silly analogy that I've started to use. Let's say we're stranded somewhere and I'm injured and you know how to save my life. You're now the doctor in that situation, although you might not have had med school. But I think, and this is kind of another question, I think that the rule, you know, the Hippocratic Oath should apply, right? First, do no harm. Even though you don't have the professional training and you didn't go to yeah. med school, you're the one who, who has that bit of knowledge that's lacking in the group, right? And so do you think that even though you might not be an official journalist or technically a journalist, that there's a certain amount of journalistic responsibility that applies to your work? Like, I think the answer is yes, because you said that you would provide sources to TYT. Absolutely. Stuff, right? Yeah, no, I take that stuff very seriously, actually. And integrity. I, yeah, and I, I don't know. I can't speak to any of the other contributors that I work with. But for me personally, that's always been like, like a, a really, really high priority, I would say, even whenever I'm doing stuff for myself, like when I'm working on a podcast episode, I still sourced my 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 points just in case somebody asked me where something came from, I can say it was here, you know, mm. or if I have like the show notes, I say these were all the sources. And I think part of that is I want people to know that I am doing my best to not lie to people or not to mislead people because I really, I think I got into this in the first place because there's so much misinformation out there and there's, there's so many ways to even interpret data. So even if you have, you have one bullet point or one fact, there's still different ways to interpret it and to spin it into a story or whatever it is that you're trying to do with it. And I think it's, I do my best to not mislead people in any way. Of course, you're trying to craft a narrative as far as like making it interesting for people to listen to and put together a cohesive story um, instead of just spitting out like a bullet point um, list of facts to people. But um, I, my goal is to provide people with the information and then give them some context and then say, you go figure out how you feel about it. You know, so you're and, not trying to change minds. I'm not not actively. No, I'm trying to keep people informed. And I think through that, um, I think that's the base level of, of anything, you know, and I, I always encourage compassion and empathy and understanding, but also further education. Right. I'm always learning all the time. Right. I don't have everything figured out, so I'm not going to pretend to tell somebody else what it is because I don't know. Maybe I don't know. Right. This is what makes sense to me right now, but maybe that could change in the future with different experiences or different information or whatever, what are, what have you. And um, so my my point, my goal is always to give people like a starting point from which they can go forth and, you know, relate that to their own personal experiences, what they know of life, you know, and what they know of life is going to be very different from what I know of life. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone's reality is different. So... I believe in the facts starting there. And also, if I misspeak, if I say something wrong, I want to know about it, you know, because I want to fix my mistake. Do you like that term edutainment or edutainer? Have you heard that? I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, you I think it's fine. Um, I, th it's a I think it's too gimmicky, maybe or silly. Yeah, I think it's I think it's silly. But um, I mean, everything's silly, though. Right. Like if you ask me. Mm -hmm everything if you ask me everyone is a huge dork and everything is silly right like i i see the world that way i think everyone is a dork if, if you talk to anybody long enough you'll see that they're just a huge dork if you talk to you know chris evans long enough you're like you're a dork you know whoever it is so edutainment um i think that's fine because you have to be entertaining, you have to be engaging for people to want to listen to you in the first place, right? Learning does not have to be boring, it should be fun, it should be engaging. Um, the, I guess the thing to look out for would be making sure that you're not focusing too much on the entertainment side of things. And um, yeah. with things like Instagram and TikTok and Twitter or threads, whatever, 
uh, there's always the, the onus to be more provocative and more expletive and things like that, because that's how you get views and that's how you get growth, like quick growth, fast growth. That's how you go viral. I don't go viral because <laughs> I don't, I have like a really bad social media presence. I'm bad at social media, but it's almost like a stubborn resistance to it because I don't want to be that because I think that it's really easy to say something very quick and snappy in a 30 second video, but there's no context there. And that's why I went the opposite way. And I started a podcast, you know, I was like, no, I need 45 minutes to talk about this, not 30 seconds. And, um, you know, that's my own personal style. Of course, I'm not expecting everyone to do something like that. And it's a lot of work. I always joke that I never make things easy on myself. Like mm -hmm. if I really wanted to, I could have just been like a makeup blogger and just talk about mascara all day. No offense to makeup bloggers, of course. But of course, I was like, I'll do geopolitics instead, you know. So, well, um, yeah, I, I mean, you you want clicks, you want views, but yeah. you don't do things just for clicks and views. Right. Do you yeah. think do you think that your work inspires people to. Take take this stuff more seriously and and you know everyone's like oh do your research and what they mean is spend more time on facebook or something weird like that but do you yeah. think like the way you go about it inspires viewers and people who absorb your work to sort of take on that same level of um interest in their own lives i i have no idea but i would hope so um and i think in my videos especially i say that and when i have my podcast i say that pretty often it's like you know what this is your starting point. You go forth and keep reading and keep learning as much as you can about this. And I'll give you all the buzzwords so you know exactly where to start, you know, start Googling or whatever it is, you know. And I, I really do hope that people take me, take that advice, you know, because I want them to, you know, and there, there's no way that I can fit everything about one single topic or even one single news story into a 10 minute video. There's just no way. And yeah. I, I hope that people... And I, even, you know, whenever I offer my commentary at the end, um, a friend of mine, actually, uh, who is a journalist, uh, he he jokingly, but also very truthfully said that I have a neurotic boat sideism about me. Mm. And um, it's it's kind of true, you know, and it's not that I'm trying to endorse one side and the other and saying both are equal, both are this, right? But what it is, is you can understand, I think you should understand both sides of an issue, right? And they should be there, they should be present. It's not an endorsement of both sides. I'm saying this is what these people over here think. This is how they see it. This is yeah. how they believe. And this is why they vote the way they do, you know, whether or not you agree with that, whether or not you think that's a good reason to vote a certain way, it doesn't really matter because this is this is why, you know? And yeah, even, even if you'd like... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, I'm I didn't mean to. Well, he, I was going to say, even if you outright hate something, it's important to know why. It's important yeah. to have that perspective, that other person's perspective. And mm -hmm. you work with a lot of like very inspiring people and, and people who really have, you know, a desire to figure things out, not just be set in their ways. And mm -hmm. but it is easy to get sort of locked in. Right. Yeah. And I wonder is there any one person and you don't have to name names, but you know, professionally or personally, do you allow for like at least one person in your life to instantly shift your way of thinking? Like you think you've got something figured out and then somebody comes along with this alternate take and you're like, Oh, now I have to rethink it. Is there somebody like that? Yeah. I think there's probably a few people like that in my oh, life. Okay. Wow. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm grateful for them, you know, and, and sometimes people I say do. no all the time. People say no. Yeah. <laughs> Oh no! Is that good? I don't know. Because um, I think, like for me personally, I have a tendency to get very like passionate about things. Mm -hmm. And for the people in my life who know me personally, sometimes it's just like you need to calm down. I'm like, you're right. I need to calm down. Um, but yeah, like there's definitely people in my life who say, "Well, what about this?" You know, and it's not in a confrontational way and it's not in a dismissive way or anything like that. And it's just like, well, what about this? And I'm like, oh, yeah, what about that? You know, and then mm -hmm. I, you just have to, like, stop and think for a second. And I think it always comes back to listening more than speaking sometimes, which is ironic because I speak for a living. But um, in your personal life, definitely you have to listen to people and you have to know when to listen and you have to 
give the people the same respect that you would like from them. You know, you can't just expect to sit there and talk and preach at people all day and then not give them that same respect back and not give them that same opportunity to present their own views on something. So yeah, I, I try, I try to <laughs> at least. Good or bad, like positive or negative. What's one thing that you would improve or change in your line of work? It could be technical or. Like for me personally know. or for the industry? Uh, either. I mean, I really just, I, I really do hate the technical side of things. You know, I've learned a lot though. And I think that I, I underestimate how, how much I have learned. So, um, so that's cool. And I guess it's given me a whole separate skill set. So maybe, maybe it's a good thing. I don't know. The technical side sucks for me. Um, what I, I do have issues with the industry in general in that like, so much of it is built on like social presence and social standing and social media and things like that. Um, if I could get off Instagram entirely, I would, right? But I keep it. And if you look at my Instagram, I, I you can tell that I am not like a good Instagrammer. Like I, I think the last thing I posted <laughs> uh, me was neither. like, yeah, like I think I posted something like two months ago or something. And that was me saying, oh, I haven't posted in a while. Let me post something, mm. you know? That's me being deliberate about it, or I'll throw something up on my story. Um, <clears throat> but going forward, I'm going to have to have a more consistent, reliable um, presence if I want to continue growing in the space, I think. And, you know, and some of my colleagues, like they do it so well, you know, like they're so good at TikTok and they're so good at Instagram and they're so good at just being out there. And I just like most of the time can't be bothered. And in this line of work that I have somehow stumbled into, I have to bother with it. So yeah. um, that's like a personal thing that I struggle with a little bit. And also um, the idea of like personal branding, right? All of a sudden, I'm not just yeah. Yasmin. I'm a brand, you know, I'm a, a, a thing. I'm a person. And it's just so funny because like in my personal life, I'm, I'm just Yasmin, you know, but on the internet, I'm like a thing, you know, I'm not a big thing by any means, but it's like a thing, you know, now I'm, now I'm Yasmin with TYT. Now I'm Yasmin podcast host, you know? And uh, so I think for a while, I also kind of struggled with that as far as like, how do I present myself and what I what I ended up doing is like, whatever, like my check on myself to make sure I'm not getting too inauthentic or too one thing over another is just like, I post things on my Instagram story that are either interesting or funny to me. It's just for me. I don't care if anybody else finds it interesting or funny. It's for me. If I do, then I post it, you know, if it makes me feel good or whatever, I'll post it. And that's my, that's my check, you know, because I think there's always the impulse to or the you feel obligated to like post and post and post and i was like i'm just not gonna do it yeah I, I mean you know even if even if you weren't doing this for a living um we live in such a front lines world that people are just constantly i mean you can't look at social media without being like oh now i'm depressed yeah I, i'm doom yeah. scrolling and i didn't even mean to it's just yeah. kind of on the feed i wonder how do you unplug how do you escape how do you get away? Like, yeah. give us some advice. <clears throat> well, I think it's funny because I think people assume that I'm just like always online and always on my phone. I'm not. Um, when I'm not doing a show or working on a video or whatever, I'm not really on my phone very much at all. Um, sometimes I'll leave it in a different room. I'm just like sick of my phone at this point in life, you know, and I and I don't like that I'm feeling disconnected from the real world um, because of my phone. I don't like how it's always in my it's right here. You know, it's like it's just it's mm -hmm. here all the time. And I it, it's kind of conflicting because I've made a lot of really great connections through my phone and through social media. Like that's how J.R. Jackson found my blog was just because I posted something and however he found it, you know? So I owe a lot to that. And I somehow got really good at like actually networking on these social networks. Um, but I do, I have a lot of hobbies that I, that I, that I've taken up. And, uh, 
So whenever I'm not working or any of that, I am cooking or I'm baking or I'm decorating my house or I'm playing with my hair or like whatever it is, you know, and whenever I'm doing that, even if I'm cleaning, right, I try not to have headphones in my ears when I'm doing that and just try, I have to really work at like being present because I think I'm not, my head is always in a million different places. So it's like a deliberate thing for me to do. Um, and it's very meditative, I think, especially like sweeping and doing the dishes, you know, because like you're doing something and in a weird way, it reminds me of, you know, back in the nineties before we all had devices that we were glued to and social media, that's how I used to exist as a child. And it feels comforting to like return to that peacefulness, you know, not feeling obligated to have a podcast in my ear all the time, you know, not worrying about what I'm not learning, what I'm missing out on, you know, just this is what I'm doing right now. And, and I have to meditate. I've, well, I've been meditating for a long mm. time, like before any of this, but that's been a really useful skill. Even if it's just like in the mornings, whenever I wake up, I'll just sit quietly for like 15 minutes before I start doing anything. You know, even if it's as simple as that, with my tea or whatever, you know, that's I, what I do. I once saw, I saw my honeymoon in Tulum, Mexico. This is before, my understanding now is it's like a big resort, but once upon a time, it was very quiet. And I watched this kid, his job every day was to clean seaweed up off the beach. And I said, I know he's not getting paid what he should for that. Mm -hmm. And this probably isn't like the job that he wants, but I wish I could trade places with him to be off the grid. Right. Do you have like a desire to get off the grid? I mean, I do. yeah, like possible. very much. Yeah. Um, like totally off. Like that's it. No, not, not like totally tech free, but no. Phone, yeah. I no mean, internet. yeah. Well, so my fiance always jokes that I would love to like live in a city. And he, he said if, if he and I broke up tomorrow, he would probably go live in the woods somewhere in a cabin, like a full Walden, you know, just like Henry Thoreau in the woods. And so that's always the joke is he's going to go full walled in without me. But um, I'm, I would also be okay with that. I would love to live in a place where I think a lot of this also, if you knew where I lived, there are no trees anywhere. It just roads. It's very suburban, just cookie cutter houses, all that. And it like makes me crave nature. And I'm also from the Northeast. I'm from Connecticut, right? And I was outside all the time playing when I was a kid. And I stopped when I moved to Texas because it's too hot and the grass is weird. And there are things in the grass that will kill you. You know, like there's like fire ants down here. In I'm in South Carolina. I know. Yeah. Yeah. I like, was attacked by fire ants last week. See what I mean? So I, don't, I don't mess with any of that stuff. So I like don't go outside in the grass mm. here where I live. And it's really sad. And my fiance, like when we first started hanging out, uh, he was like, oh, she doesn't like being outside. She hates the outdoors. And I was like, that's not true at all. I just don't like it here. <laughs> you know, I just don't like it in yeah. Texas. And yeah, whenever we travel, I'm always just like in the grass running around, you know, like whatever. When I went back to my old park in Connecticut where I grew up, I took a nap outside and there was geese there. And my fiance, like, he just he couldn't believe it that I was outside nice. in the grass under under a tree, you know. <laughs> but I think that I definitely feel like I need to get back to nature, like, because I, I feel starved of nature here. So and may, maybe I could do more to pursue it, but I would have to go out of my way to find nature where I live. So I mean, I I love engagement like this and talking to the chat sometimes i'll do a show where i'm just taking calls and hanging out yeah but if it all came crashing down i'd be cool with that yeah you know? i i think it's like people would adapt a lot quicker and easier than they they think they would i think yeah. there would be a weird period of you know not knowing what to do with your hands kind of thing yeah. um but other than that like I, I was on a cruise one time and it was like it was like a big family cruise. I have a huge extended family and a bunch of us where it was like 30, 40 of us on this cruise. And, um, you know, your phone doesn't work when you're in the middle of the ocean. And I, I started bringing my phone with me everywhere I was going just to take pictures. But then after a while, I was like, I don't even want this. You know, I just would yeah. leave it in the room and I didn't have my phone on me for like a week or two. And I didn't miss it at all, you know, because I'm engaging with people. There's people around me. I am having fun. I'm doing activities. I'm eating and like actually eating my food, not like taking pictures of it, not like tweeting about it or whatever, you know, and it, it was really freeing. And but it, it was such a natural shift back to that, you know, like you don't miss it. So 
I, yeah, I, I think do like those times. It's like the internet's given everyone this sense that they should know everything or because, because you could know something instantly that you should know it. And, and I always, I always tell people, you know, there was a time cause I'm, I'm 48. There was a time in my life, like a, a large chunk of my life where you would just like ask somebody older than you or read a book, right. Or, or figure it out. And it wasn't always like I can know instantly right now. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I think that takes a lot away from, um, and there's some positives to it for sure, right? Mm -hmm. Streamlining information. That's great. But, but it takes away that, that will to, um, do things for yourself. And I think that would come back right away. Yeah. For a lot of people. I, I was actually just I talking know. to my aunt about that the other day and she, we were like, you know what, you know what kids need? They need to just go outside and sit with somebody old and just talk. You know, yeah. and I was like, yeah, yeah, I don't think they do that anymore. <laughs> And I think like my generation, I'm, uh, I'll be 35 in a few months, right? So I'm 34. Uh, I was born in 88. And um, I think my generation is probably one of the last that um, actually had to go to the library to do research for papers in, in high school, you know, like that was still a thing. In high school, I remember we still had stipulations like, you can only have two of your sources from the internet and it can't be Wikipedia, you know? Oh. And, then every, and then we also had to have like three or four sources from a book. You know, so we were still doing that. And even into college, we still had to have book sources. And um, I remember whenever I was working on those papers, I would end up just like naturally using more book sources because there's so much more information in the book because like, look how much information is in the book and not yeah. just, you know, sheer facts and data, but the context, you know, and I think that's what's lacking in a lot of society these days. And a lot of um, like, if you have a question and you Google it, you find the answer. Google just like puts it right there at the top for you in bold. So you don't have to read any further. Yep. You're, it's in a book you're reading before you're reading after, you know, so just naturally you get a lot more context. Well, that's why I'm grateful for you being here tonight and talking about this kind of stuff with me so that we can learn straight from you instead of looking it up or reading about it on Wikipedia. Um, the way I like to end these interviews is by recommending a comic book to my okay. guest. We're really big on that here. This is a little bit different though. Um, cause I've been trying to in the, in the last handful, I've been trying to really figure out something cause you don't read comic books, right? Am I right about that? Have you I, ever? I don't, but I'm, I'm open to it. Okay. So I, I'm trying to get people to realize and, and get people into comic books as, um, you know, an art form and a medium that doesn't just have to do with, superheroes and, yeah. and masks yeah. and stuff right and so this one is a unique book it's more of a book of comics it's okay. uh do you like peanuts yeah Charlie brown and all that mm -hmm. this is called peanuts the art of charles m schultz edited and designed by graphic artist chip kid do you know okay. chip kid no should i okay well i don't know but <laughs> Chip Kidd is best known for his artistic book covers and creative interior layouts. So his books are appealing. Like, let's say you're not into Batman. If you saw a Chip Kidd book about Batman, you'd have to have it. Okay. Just because of the way he, his design sensibility and the way he presents it appeals to everyone. Um, I'm a huge Charles Schultz fan. But, um, and, and this might come into play because you were talking about um, doing like, you know, home decorating or interior design right because this yeah. would be the perfect book for a shelf that's like for your guest you know oh, what i mean cool. or like yeah, a coffee okay. table or something so um it's normally what they would do is do a collection of comic strips for peanuts and just reprint them but in this case they photographed 500 of them so they found originals and photographed them and then arranged them in the book along with a whole bunch of artwork by charles schultz like mm -hmm. throughout his life so you can see the progression of you know, when he was in the army and, and just doodling all the way up to like when he was doing the strips professionally, mm -hmm. there's more than 500 comic strips reproduced, uh, as well as like rare and never before seen stuff from his sketchbook. That's really cool. I actually remember when they started including uh, the Peanuts comic strips in the newspaper when I was a kid, because they, they weren't oh, yeah. always there. And then one day they, they were and I was like, whoa, this is this is good. <laughs> Like this yeah, is that's an improvement. Cool. Yeah, that was exciting for me as a kid. So that that's that's yeah, that's a really good recommendation. Thank you. Okay, but look, I get I just gotta let you know. 
It's been reprinted a bunch. If okay. you do look for it and you see one that's like five hundred dollars, that's one of the original hardback books. Those are really hard to get and they're expensive. But you what can get recommendation. Well, but they've been reprinted a lot of times, so you can yeah. get them in paperback. They're very affordable. Okay. You can find very decent copies used. It would be great to have as a used book, actually, because yeah, um, cool. they're reproduced anyway, so you can see like grainy paper texture and stuff like that so what is new when it comes yeah. to that right it looks yeah. vintage already so so used wouldn't ruin the appeal um but you know it's a story of a great american cartoonist and his artistic development so it's very much the sort of thing that you know any comic book fans listening would also want to have um and, and you know i'm a massive peanuts fan so i have yeah. all this stuff um yeah, so check that out. I'll put that online tomorrow, but later tonight I'll put the final art after I do some touch-ups and and blending and uh, refinement of Yasmin. And so follow me on social media and check that out. Remember to scroll down into the description of this podcast and look at all the links for Yasmin stuff. Keep your eye out for more. There's always going to be something great coming from Yasmin. Just around a point, it's right around the corner. And, and then there's something, right, something around the right around the corner. So keep your right around the corner. Keep your eyes, I, your eyes peeled. Um, is is there anything else you want to plug? Or I know you were just on the damage report yesterday, right? Yeah, I'll be on Indisputable tomorrow. Cool. Um, and then, of course, I have my Rebel HQ breakdown content that I produce uh, Tuesday through Friday. So Great. All yeah. right. Well, thank you very much for being here. And I want to thank everybody else for being here. We'll be back here Monday, 9.30 p.m. with Dave Griscom of Left Reckoning. Until then, we'll see you later. Bye, Yasmin. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. The letter hack. Oh, my gosh. You don't miss, folks.